time now. So uh, we're going to talk about DSLs and how to write them in Kotlin. I, I've written a, a sample one called Jerky, uh, which I'll explain here in just a little bit. But uh, for those of you that don't know me, there's uh, some faces that I don't know. Uh, I am Jason Lee. I'm a senior principal software engineer. Uh, it says NetSuite. It's technically Oracle. Uh, we bought a year or so ago. Um, so our agenda today, uh, introduction, what is a DSL in case uh, you're unfamiliar with the term. Uh, we'll look at some examples. Uh, and then we'll walk through how Kotlin can help, kind of take a look at the building blocks that Kotlin provides that makes uh, building DSLs uh, so easy and some might even say fun. And then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at jerky. All right, so who am I? Jason Lee, Senior Print Tribe Architect. Um, I work on a, a team called Site Management Tools. We build WYSIWYG tools for managing a sweet commerce site, which is an e-commerce solution built on top of NetSuite's platform, uh, which may not mean a whole lot to you, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool, uh, pretty cool technology. It's a, it's a great tool, but I, uh, I help kind of shape some of the technical decisions, uh, particularly on the server side, and um, that's probably enough on that. Oh, I am the author of Java 9 Programming Blueprints. I put a lot of work into that, so I'm going to tack that on in my presentation. Go buy a copy, leave a good review, unless you don't like it, and then uh, feel free not to say anything. All right, so what is a DSL? Uh, it stands for Domain Specific Language. Um, I mean, simply put, it's a, it's a language that's designed for a specific problem area or, or domain. Uh, when we think about languages like Java, JavaScript, Python, those are general purpose languages that are designed to solve a myriad of problems. And you know, each, each language has its strengths, so it's better in certain areas. But it is a general purpose language. Um, a DSL or domain specific language is uh, it's a smaller language and it's targeted at a specific problem typically so you wouldn't write uh, a large say an ERP system in, in, a, in a DSL because uh, it's it's too specific uh, some some general examples I thought might be helpful uh, and I, I went and looked up get a list some of these are I think are a little questionable HTML is listed as one uh, it's markup language designed for for building say, a, a DOM in a browser. CFML, if you're unfortunate enough to have used Cold Fusion years ago, I think that's still going. SQL, is it still going, Bob? Okay, she would know. <laughs> um, I think Hobby Lobby might still have some going there. I hope not. But people are productive with it. They like it, so good on them. SQL is probably the one that most people are familiar with. at the structured query language, and it's, it's very tightly focused on querying a relational database. Uh, and again, you wouldn't use that to write uh, an ERP or e-commerce or, or a game, have you, because it's, it's focused on querying. Yak, there's a nice technical one. Yet another compiler, compiler, I think. It's a language for describing languages and how to build a compiler. And Gradle. Uh, Gradle has a, it's got a DSL for describing how to build systems. Um, so we've seen all those. You've probably used them whether you realize it or not. Um, some Kotlin specific DSLs, and I think this will give you kind of a flavor of, of uh, what DSLs look like in Kotlin and, and why I think they're so cool. This one is kotlinx.html. It's a, a language for, for building HTML documents. It's a little more focused, uh, or uh, a little more, I'd say, type safe than HTML would be. Um, so here we've, we're building a, a body. It's got a div in it. It has, has an anchor tag. You can see the link to it. We want to set the target on it and give it a description. So you can kind of see they're nice and concise. You're not wading through tag soup trying to figure out, you know, where are the important bits on this. You don't have to worry about closing the tags because this will, will build all of that for you. And I should say, technically speaking, what we have here is a type safe builder is the term that you'll see in the, the Kotlin documentation. This lets you build something in a type safe manner. And here, once we, we build this data structure, we can then, there's a, a method that I'll have here uh, that will actually create the HTML for you. Uh, Anko, if you uh, work with Android, you've probably seen this. Uh, it does more than just build UIs, uh, but I think, at least from my experience, what I know it most for is, uh, is building UIs. Has anyone done Android development? If you've worked with that, the XML files, you know, those can be very verbose. 
uh, kind of hard to work with. This gives you a nice type safe way to do that. So you know that if you were to see this expressed in the Android XML, you'd have, was it Android colon text view, and then you have all these attributes that are namespaced and links be very, very verbose. And again, just like the, uh, the last one, this strips away all of that stuff. So you can get right down to, to what you're after. That'll create a text view object. It'll call the L params. Uh, and this is an interesting example too, because you see here on the, uh, the L params call here, we're actually creating a text view object and then we're calling that method. And then on there, you can see we have named parameters. So that uh, L params method, if you were to look at the source code, will have uh, well, at least two, I think it's got several parameters on there. They're given default values and names. So here we're just entered in two of them. So we call those out specifically. We uh, accept the defaults on the rest of them. And then with that L params object, then we can set, uh, set the margin on it. It's kind of a weird object structure there, but that's what that looks like in ANCO. And Tornado FX, if you've done any Java FX programming, this is a, it's a great library. I love this one. Uh, I might do a talk on it later in the fall. We'll see. But we're going to create a view, and in that object, we're, uh, we're initializing a, a person's that's a collection, an observable collection, because that's what uh, Java FX uses to help uh, synchronize your application state and the view state. So we'll create an observable array list, put some data in there, and then we're going to define the root view of our view, and that happens to be a table view of type persons. Uh, and then we specify some columns. Um, the column, uh, the name is ID, and the method we're going to call, so it, since we have, we're passing persons here, uh, we've got a, a typed table view. It's a parameterized or generic, so it knows it's going to take a person. So we're passing a method reference there person ID, person name. So for that column for each row, uh, we're, we're telling the system to call this, call the, the name function on the person object you've given to get the value for that, for that column. Pretty cool. All right, so how can Kotlin help? Um, there are a lot of things in the language that, that lend itself to, to writing DSLs. And the primary one you've all seen are, are lambdas. Is everyone familiar with lambdas? You've seen them in practice and like, uh, you know, even Java has them now. So, you know, it's, it's cool, uh, cool enough that, uh, that we finally got them in, in Java. But it's an anonymous function, uh, more or less. There's, there's some, uh, some more subtleties to it, but you can, you can think of that as an anonymous function. Typically, you would define, you know, say in Java, public void my function pass a list of parameters, and it's a it's a static thing in in the compiler. With lambdas, though, you can just define them on the fly. It's a, a first class object, so you can do um, lots of interesting things with it. For example, you can assign it to a variable if you want to, uh, you know, uh, val function equals whatever, and you can actually call that method through the function or through the, through the variable uh, if you want to. You can pass it to a function and you can return it from a function. Um, we get into things, higher order functions or, or functions that, that take or return a function. So you can do a lot of neat things with it and that is really gonna be the heart of, of how DSLs work uh, in Kotlin. And it has something called lambda with receivers. Um, it makes the properties of the receiving class available without qualifying them. Otherwise, you'd, once you get in there, you'd have to say it dot name or it dot whatever with the uh, with the receiver, and we'll we'll see an example of what that looks like uh, in just a minute. Uh, but that lets you define the type of object that you're that you're operating on, so you get a little little nicer, more concise code, um, uh, which the next point leads to cleaner code. You don't have it dot scattered everywhere. Uh, if you're dealing with this or that kind of thing, you know that kind of gets wordy. Uh, sometimes you have to have it, but the receiver lets you lets you avoid that. And it's, just, it's especially important in nested scenarios where we'll see, you know, if you need to make a reference to the to a parent object, but everything is called it, then trying to uh, specifically dereference something in the parent class gets really weird. And assuming you don't have name collisions, uh, if you're not qualifying with it, uh, the compiler can kind of figure out what you want typically. Operator overloading. Java doesn't support this, uh, which kind of made me sad moving from C and C++, but Kotlin does. And there are a ton of them. I've just kind of, I've picked out some, uh, some of the major ones. 
if you want the unary plus or minus or the um, uh, whatever the plus plus is called, I'm drawing a blank there. Uh, but you can see there on the left, we've got, this is what it looks like in your code, plus A, minus A, A plus plus, A plus B. And you can see the, the method that it actually calls. Um, so we're not, you know, the JVM doesn't support operator overloading necessarily, but what the compiler does for you. So when it sees code like this on the left, it makes that function call for you on the right. So in your class, if you've got two types, um, you know, I don't know, you've got, uh, you've got an order and you want to add a, uh, a line item to it, you can say order plus line item or plus equals whatever you and define the plus method and the compiler will do that work for you. So internally you add that to a list or whatever. Uh, but from your code, it's nice and concise. And we've got some more there. We've got, uh, you can do ranges, you can do, does this contain, you know, A and B, A plus equals B, A greater than B. Uh, so it, this allows us to, uh, to, to overload those operators, which gives us some, uh, some nicer, um, natural ways of expressing things. If this will let me uh, slip back here. If we look back here at the Kotlin X example, we can kind of see that here with the, uh, the plus operator. We're gonna add a string to our anchor object. And uh, I'm just kind of guessing going off context, but if we were to look at the code there, there's gonna be a plus method that takes a string and then it's gonna store that in some property internally. So when we render that tag, we get a href equals, you know, the tag and then that text. So, but this lets us do that very, very neatly rather than having to create some oddly named uh, property that might be foreign coming from a, an HTML perspective. Extension functions. And this is a really cool one in Kotlin. You'll see this used uh, in a lot of places. But this lets us add functions to an existing class. Um, the example here I, I pulled from the, from the Kotlin docs, if you want to swap two elements in a list, the list doesn't natively support that, so what we have here is a function. It's uh, parameterized, so it can take, uh, it'll work with any mutable list of type T, you know, whatever it happens to be. We're gonna add the swap method. We give it index one and two. I'll talk louder. Um, so anyway, you know, the logic there is not super important, but that, that adds the swap method to, uh, to that class. So anytime we have a mutable list, if we've imported this method, we can then uh, just call swap and the compiler does that work for us. Uh, some important things to remember there, if you use this as you're developing your own DSL, um, well, the classes aren't, aren't modified, I kind of covered that. Um, but they are dispatched statically, not vertically. Oh, that's much better. Whew. Um, and what that means, if you come from a C++ background or really into language, that might make more sense. But um, when you override a class and you overload a method, you know, if you've got class C implements get name and class D extends C also implements get name. If you have an object whose runtime type is D and you call get name, the system will dispatch that virtually to D.getName even if the method takes a C, since D is a C, you can still call C.getName and the runtime type is D, so it calls getName and returns, I don't know, D. Extension functions are not the same way. So if you have those two classes and you define an extension, method, extension function on both classes with the same name, if you, uh, if you have a function that takes a C and you pass an instance of D to it and call the extension function, it will call the function on the C class, not D. It's determined statically at compile time, not runtime. So it's going to look at the at the enclosing scope and say, "Oh, I've got a, a function of or a variable of type C." So it's going to call that on the the C class. So uh, something to keep in mind uh, should you uh, start overloading some of those uh, extension functions. So it's not quite as nice as having a, an actual method on the class, but it is uh, it is better than nothing. All right, so. Let's kind of get to it. Um, <laughs> every project needs a name, and, and I'm a sucker for, uh, for bad names. So jerky is Jersey plus Kotlin. So let's you get jerky. Um, I was going to put Sasquatch on here, but um, I didn't, uh, didn't want to mess with him. They, his lawyers might get angry. But 
so what we're going to do with our DSL is define a, a JAXRS or a REST application. Has anyone used JAXRS? It is, uh, it's, well, it's a great library, but it's a little verbose. You declare a class, you put a path annotation on there, you declare a number of methods, and you annotate those. And when the runtime starts up, it does some, uh, some introspection to figure out what all this stuff is and builds a data model so it knows how to dispatch stuff. Works great. It's a little verbose. So what we're going to do is build a DSL that allows us to describe that much more concisely. All right, and we also want to handle the request in Kotlin. Uh, one of the strong uh, arguments for Kotlin is, is the Java interop, and it's really, really good. So you can migrate parts of your application and not do the whole system. You know, if you move to, well, Scala's not a good choice because it technically has interop, but if you want to migrate to, I don't know, Ruby or JavaScript, uh, it's real difficult to have both of those running at the same time because they're just different runtimes. Uh, but with Java and, and Kotlin, you can jump back and forth uh, with very little pain. I'll say that. There's, there's going to be some, some rough edges here and there. But, um, so we're going we're gonna to do that, and we'll see uh, a lot of that. Caveats on this. I should uh, say this up front. This is purely for educational purposes. As I started thinking about this and looking at the examples that are out there, you know, we've got HTML, we've got Android and JavaFX UIs. So I was trying to find something different as I worked through the process. So how do I build one of these that was different enough so I wasn't just kind of repeating what's out there. Uh, but it was also somewhat in, uh, in line with, with my particular problem area, which is building uh, REST APIs. Um, so that's, that's how I picked that particular domain. It is not necessarily intended for production use. If someone is so motivated, they can take this code and and make it bulletproof. But uh, there's also a dearth of detailed, deep thought on this. You know, uh, I'm, I'm an architect at the office, but for this, I just kind of slap something together that kind of looks a lot like the Java class uh, and method model. So it's not necessarily an ideal structure for the language, um, but hopefully it demonstrates the, uh, demonstrates the idea well enough. Uh, security is completely unsupported on this, so um, don't look for that. Don't ask. <laughs> I haven't gone. I've gone farther than I really planned to. I, I've got it supporting server sent events and and some things like that because I just wanted to see if I could do it. Uh, but security, I have not gotten around to. Doesn't support filters. If you're familiar with those from Jaxar and that kind of thing. And if you use this in production, just put a nice little bow on it. You are a special kind of crazy. Um, so. Do with it what you will. Don't uh, don't get upset with me <laughs> if uh, if things break. All right. So what do we want our DSL to look like? Uh, here we 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 declare an application. We want to tell it what port to run on. We want to you know maybe set the default MIME types for what uh, what is produced and what the application consumes. And then we want to declare a resource. Uh, in this particular example, it's kind of a subset of, of what we'll see implemented. We've got uh, one resource that listens, that lives on the path items. Uh, the takes a get method on that. The handler you can see is list items. You, that's the Kotlin syntax for a, uh, a method or function reference. Uh, I don't have it defined here, but I do have a function called list items, and this gets a, 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 a handle for that that we can then pass around. And we declare uh, one parameter ID is of type short. All right, so we'll jump into the code, and I'll try to find my editor. Nope, oh, there it is. Too many windows. All right, well, I intended to have a, a, a blank slate on this. Um, in fact, you can see. I'm doing something really, really dumb and doing things 100% live. All right, so we're going to 
click the right button here. All right, so we've got a blank project set up. I don't want to spend too much time on this, um, but uh, all this POM does really is set up the dependencies on Kotlin and some, some uh, Jersey dependencies, so we have the library. Um, I didn't write tests, so there's another caveat for you. This is um, untested, but this is uh, just typical Kotlin build setup. Um, and we've got uh, stuff run there from the command line. So let's start. We will create a new package. If it'll let me do that. All right, so we want a new create a new Kotlin class. It's not recognizing that as a Kotlin project. That's why you should never do this live. Oh, we may have to switch back to other project. All right, well, we'll just do that. We'll walk through uh, existing code. All right, so let, let's start with our um, our top level class. We're gonna create an application. Can you guys see that okay? I can zoom that in. Well, I thought I had the keystrokes. That better? Okay. All right. So we're going to declare uh, a class called application. And now, if you have, how many here have used Kotlin before or familiar with the language? No one. Okay. Uh, which is fine. Uh, I just don't want to go into too much detail. Um, by default, uh, everything is public in Kotlin. One of the design principles was they want a really good Java interop and they wanted to reduce a lot of the ceremony that we see in our Java code, public, public, final, whatever. So by default, all classes, all methods are public and they are final. If you don't like that, then you have to opt into that. And there are keywords for that. So here we've got a public class. Uh, we declare a, a, some variables here. Um, you can declare var is a mutable variable val is immutable and since these are properties on the class this is going to automatically generate for us getters and setters for our java interop from kotlin we'll just say application.produces equals and the compiler will call the setter for us behind the scenes so that saves us some uh some work there so we're going to set some default values uh it is a var so it is mutable so we can change that in our builder and we're going to default to returning JSON and consuming anything, you know. Um, that seemed like a reasonable uh, choice. Uh, Going to listen on the on the root context, if you will, on port 8080 on localhost. All right, uh, we've got. Um, well, that's our basic data structure. Okay. Um, if we go over here to jerky is my uh, my test class here you can see we're going to declare a type or a variable type application these are that's helpers uh, in the IDE I didn't actually specify the type Kotlin will infer that for me it knows that when I call application it returns a certain type so it infers a type for me but the IDE is adding that so I don't have to have to guess um, but I, I call application, and when you create a new class in, Java, in Kotlin, you don't say new class name like you do in Java, it's just class name in parentheses. But here, 
uh, what we actually have is, an app, is, a, is a function, which I defined down at the bottom here. Uh, and this will be our entry point for defining the, the DSL. And you'll see this, uh, all, the, all the DSLs I looked at in Kotlin have this type of entry point. Uh, so we've got a, uh, a function called application. Uh, it has uh, one variable of type uh, called init. And its type is a lambda with receiver. When I talked about that earlier, um, it's, a, it's a lambda. We see uh, the, the parens. It's a function that returns type unit, which is kind of the Kotlin equivalent of void. But we've got application dot on there. So that tells the compiler that what we're going to pass is going to be something of type application. And that kind of makes the code uh, a little cleaner. This, this particular method is super simple. Uh, we're going to call application. We're going to create a new instance. We're going to call apply. The base, um, base type of every class in Kotlin is, is called any, capital A, any. In Java, it's object. In Kotlin, it's any. And the any class defines a method called apply. And it takes a lambda. And it's going to take that lambda and then run it in the context of that class. So here, since we have that receiver, we know we, we can create the application, we call apply, and we pass it the lambda. And it just, it does the work for us. Basically, it's gonna, well, it's gonna run that in the context of that class. You'll also notice, uh, if you are uh, eagle-eyed, that we're calling a function, but we don't have any parentheses on there. You notice that right here, we just say application, and then we go straight to our lambda. That's another uh, syntax uh, nicety uh, that, that Kotlin offers is that if the last parameter on a function is a lambda, the parentheses are, are not needed. So I could just as easily have wrapped that if I can type like that. To the compiler, that's exactly the same, but it's kind of ugly. You know, we don't really want to do that because part of the point of all this is uh, reducing some of that noise. So that's what's going on there. Yes? Uh huh. Yep. Uh, and yes. Um, trying to think if I've got an example of a lambda taking a parameter. You can. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure exactly. Just yeah. off top of what that syntax is going to look like. That. Yeah, let me see. Um. Oh, that's fine. Um, we're going to... Um. Function must have a body. Okay, I've done something to anger it. I'll try to come back to that. I'll have to. Yep. Well, function should be it, fun is the. Yeah. Yep, I've done something there to uh, to make that anger. I'm not sure. Expecting a top level declaration. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to uh, have to come back to that. All right. So uh, we call our function, creates the class, it sets the parameters for us. And notice that we've got this resource class here, uh, a resource declaration. If we jump back over to the application declaration, we've got a we've got a function here called resource, and it looks. Oddly enough, a lot like the other function. It just happens to be a member of the application class. So we're going to take a lambda uh, with receiver. It's going to take a, a resource object. It's going to return unit. Uh, the method's not going to return anything. 
And we're going to do basically the same thing. We're going to create a new resource instance. We're going to call apply and pass it that, uh, the, the land or the function that we've passed in. Uh, and then when apply returns, we're going to have a resource object. So we're going to add that to our mutable list of resources. This is also another uh, Kotlin standard library function. By default, if you create a list, it's going to be immutable. As a, as a general rule, the language designers favored immutability over mutability. Because as they looked at all the, the classes of errors we see in Java code, a lot of them came from race conditions and you know thread safety. So it defaults to, to immutable data. So list of is a, uh, an immutable list. If you want to be able to add things to it, then you want it to call mutable list, and there's a mutable hash set, and mutable set, or a um, hash set, no, set, hash map, and, and list, yeah. Um, so we're going to create the object and add it to our resource. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, in fact, we can take a look at that class as well and see it looks exactly the same. Uh, we've got a, a resource. If we want to override the produces and consumes, we can do that. We've got to set the path. Uh, this question mark here, um, one of the other classes of issues was uh, null pointer exceptions. So if you want something to accept a null in Kotlin, you have to declare to the compiler that it accepts a null. And you do that by specifying with a question mark. If I leave that question mark off and try to assign null to it, I'll get an error. And if I have uh, a method, you know, if I say, if I try to assign the value of a method that returns something that is nullable, it'll also fail. Um, so generally speaking, if it's purely Kotlin code, you should almost never see a null pointer exception. There are, there are ways to kind of get yourself uh, in a bind. But when you start talking about Java interop, the compiler just doesn't know, does that Java API return null or not? So it's going to assume that it does. So you have to handle that uh, specifically, and we can, we'll see more of that. Um, so on the resource class, we define those. We've got the handler. That's what's actually going to dispatch the call to our code. We've got a mutable map of parameters, um, specify the body type. I have SSE on there. I don't, we probably won't have time to get into that. Um, and I wrote a two string that's, uh, that's really kind of ugly and hard to read, but as I was debugging, it was, it was helpful <laughs> to, to see the structure I was building. All right, so that's we see here. We're setting the path, the method, the handler, and this points back to this function. Uh, we'll get into the, the de details there uh, in a moment. We also declare some parameters here. I, I declare several parameters. Um, we can ignore that for just a moment. Um, and this is handled exactly like the resource. Nothing real special here. A function parameter takes a lambda with the receiver. Um, So we create the class, we apply it, and we add it to our, our map. I did that in two steps for, um, since I need to pull the name out. Notice that name can be null if we look at the, the parameter class. There we go, click on the right thing. Uh, the name can be null. Um, I had a good reason for that when I, when I wrote that. Um, but since it's null, we have to handle that as well. Um, and I'll show you how we do that. But I do want to point out this is this is a data class. It's a, another uh, Kotlin feature that if you've got a, a class that just has values, a bunch of properties, getters and setters, you don't want to have to write those. You can declare a parameter or a, a data class. Um, so this one has three properties on it, source, name, type. They're all vars, so they're getters and setters. And this generates that for us. It also generates the hash code and equals and a two string. So we get all those for free uh, by the compiler. Uh, it's um, null safe uh, and all that. So if this is all you're doing with that class, that's a great way to go. Data transfer objects and that sort of thing. Uh, we've got some default values. Um, and uh, K class, Kotlin represents its classes in a slightly different object that they call K class. Uh, you can get to the Java class uh, as well, which I think we'll do uh, when we start setting up the app. Uh, but that's what that is. That's the Kotlin representation of a, a, a Kotlin class. All right. Notice that 
the parameter name uh, can be null. Um, so we have to do uh, something to the compiler. We can do a null check. Um, and Kotlin has a, a nice um, uh, null, null safe operator. We could say name question mark dot let. Well, let me qualify that. All right, and what that's going to say is it's going to evaluate that as it goes left to right. Um, param we know is not null because we just created it, but name might be. So the question mark says, if this is not null, then basically let this happen. And it's going to take that lambda that we're passing. That that's just a function uh, on, I believe it's the any class. Um, takes one parameter, it's a lambda, so we pass that in. And then here we can do anything we want to with it. Now in theory, once I pass this check, the compiler knows that name is not null, so I can do anything with it without further qualifying it. In some contexts, if the compiler can't tell that it's in a, a thread safe environment, it'll complain that this variable may have changed between the check and here, so you still have to specify that. So um, you might see that, but that's what's going on. If there's a possibility that some other thread might have changed that. Here, uh, it's a local parameter, or a local variable to that method, so we should be fine. Um, but I didn't want to do that um, for whatever reason, just to be more concise. I know it's going to come back not null, so I can use this uh, double exclamation there. Uh, officially, that doesn't have a name, but uh, some some wise guy on the internet called <laughs> called that the hold my beer operator. Like I know what I'm doing, so. Just uh, step aside and let me take care. But that's that's telling the compiler, I know this is not null. Do something with it. I've used that some when implementing uh, Java EE classes, uh, where I know the container injects values. Um, I have to declare it nullable because I don't have value at runtime. But I know that once I get inside my method, the com the container has created the class. It's done the injection, or I wouldn't be on that line of code. So there I can just use the double exclamation and move on without a whole lot of null checks. So you'll see that, and that's what's going on there. All right, so that defines our data model, and we've got some more examples here. Now, I'll go and point out this out since I'm right here, but basically we have a resource nested within a resource, which kind of doesn't make sense given how we have the data model structured. Prior to Kotlin 1.1, it would let you do that very happily. And what it's actually going to do is call the resource um, uh, function. Uh, I can't, uh, uh, it might call it on the resource class, but it's going to fail. But you know, if you have, take, uh, take for example, if you are building a, an HTML DSL or something where um, you don't want a title tag buried you know, in a div somewhere, it only belongs in head. So you want to be able to restrict where that's called. The, uh, the language declares an annotation called DSL marker. So you create a new annotation class and you put that annotation on there. And then you can uh, simply annotate your classes with that marker for your annotation. Okay, I don't have that uh, on here just yet. So if I compile and run this, it's going to run just fine. All right, so if we look if we look at our definition here, we've got items, and then here we've got resource foo. And if we look at this nice, pretty output I have here, we've got resource foo there and resource items. So it did go ahead and work, but in terms of the uh, semantics of a DSL, it looks kind of funny. So we want to be able to restrict that. So if I come back and add that Jersey DSL marker annotation, which looks just like a, a Java annotation, I think I need to put that on all of those classes. Now if I run this, it should fail. Ah. I don't know if you can read that because it's, it's kind of tiny, but it says, um, Kotlin function resource can't be called in this context by an implicit receiver, use the explicit one if necessary. So by default, it's gonna prevent me from doing that. But if I do actually want to do that, then I, there's a, 
there's a way for me to specify I want to call this method on the super class. I don't care to do that, so um, we'll just remove that. I just wanted to, to show that to you. So if you need to kind of control where these elements can be nested, that's how you do that. All right, so we've built our, our, um, our data model, and we can kind of see it all printed out uh, kind of nice and neat there. This is a, a, um, a text representation of what we just saw in, the, in our uh, actual DSL. Um, of course, there's there's a lot more, uh, a lot more there. We didn't look at the at the whole DSL, but I've got a a reasonably uh, long uh, resource tree there. So we've created it, we've assigned it to a variable called app. And now we want to start it. We'll kind of veer off a little bit from actual DSL work, but. Uh, this this part really is where kind of the, ru the rubber meets the road because we've got we've built a type safe builder uh, we have a, a type safe way of building our data model that we then need to do something with and that might be spitting out html or uh, or an android ui but in our case we want to build a, a jersey application so we've got this start method i've described my rest application now i want to start it and we kind of jumping into uh, some Jersey APIs that I don't want to spend too much time with, but this is a really good example or demonstration of the, of the interop between Kotlin and Java. Because what I'm doing now is in my Kotlin code, I'm going to call some Java APIs that were developed well before Kotlin was ever thought of. I'm going to do some work there and I'm going to set it up so that in this Java code will call back into my Kotlin code to run my methods. We kind of follow that through. So uh, just walking through in case you're just really curious, um, most of the magic is happening in this uh, jerky resource config class, and we'll, we'll look at that. And then really with the rest of these lines, I'm just uh, I'm starting up the Jersey application in a Java SE environment. I've got to build the URI that's going to listen to. We've got the host path and port off our application object, and we're going to create the server and, uh, and run it. And then just a little message there when you're done, hit enter, and it'll, it'll shut down. And then we kill it. So. That's uh, well. That's not too terribly interesting. What we actually do uh, that I think is uh, the most relevant here is in this resource config where we work on this uh, object that we've now built. So we pass in our application object to this class, which extends a uh, a, a Jersey class uh, resource config. This is the syntax here for uh, extends in Java. You would say class B extends A. Here it's class B colon A. And if you have, um, if you need to call a, a constructor on your parent, and we are here, we're just calling the default constructor. If some of the parameters are shared, then not, you know, I can say application there and pass that up if I want to. Uh, don't need to here, we're just gonna create the class. And here, uh, init method is, if you've got some code that you would normally put in your default constructor, uh, we don't have that here because the default constructor is declared in line there. If you don't have any work you need to do, you don't need a constructor or an init block at all. But this init will run when the class is created. Um, so we're going we're gonna to register a Jackson feature. That's a JaxRS or a Jersey feature that allows us to automatically convert from JSON into our Java or Kotlin object. So we don't have to do that automatically. Um, we'll create a resource builder. <laughs> Uh, we're using here a, uh, an API that Jersey developed to allow us to programmatically build a, a REST application. Rather than defining a class statically, putting annotations on it, we can actually go through and build this programmatically from a config file or, in this case, a data model that we pull from somewhere. Um, you don't necessarily need to know the details of that, but that's what, what's going on here. Um, so we're going to uh, set the, the base path for our application. Then we're going to iterate over each of our resources. Um, you remember resources, that mutable list, we're going to call the for each method. So it's going to, for each item in that list, it's going to call this lambda passing that value. And here you can see um, we've got a lambda. We're declaring a, uh, a variable. So there's, the, there's an input variable there. 
and the arrow says, here's the body of the, of the lambda. Since this is called on the list that has a type, the compiler knows at runtime, we don't have to declare the type here. The compiler can infer the type, which happens to be our resource class. Uh, so I've got a, a print line statement there, just so we can kind of see what's going on. And then we're going, we're going to build the resource, uh, again, using those APIs. Not super important that we go in, into depth there, but um, for each of the, each resource class, we're going to build a child resource from, from Jersey's perspective. Uh, and then we're going to add a, add a method on that. In our case, each child resource has a single method. Um, we, we pass in, that's the HTTP method or verb that will be used to reach this. Um, produces and consumes, and handled by, um, and we're going to create a, a call context class. In Jersey, you can have a number of parameters with some annotations and reject each of those for you. We don't really have access to that directly since um, we're not building classes, so we're going to wrap that into a context object. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in detail um, here in just a second. But we're going to pass that resource object in so we know what it's working on. And there's the SSE stuff. If I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll show that. Then we're going to register that resource that we built. So here, we, in just this little bit of code, we've walked through our data model. We have passed it on to whatever library, Jersey in this case, that needs to consume that. And then we're going to register that with the runtime. So now Jersey has, has a data model that it understands that we've built based on our, our DSL. And it can start and deploy deploy those resources. Uh, for call context, we're passing an instance of the class, so Jersey can do some injection. So we, we do get a little bit of that, which is kind of the, the nice thing about that. Uh, don't worry too much about the inflector. That's a weird internal API that, that they expose. Go and put that on the line so it's a little easier to read, perhaps. Uh, but we want to inject the headers, any security context, so we have that. Uh, technically have access to that URI info uh, and a param converter. Um, I worked a long, this isn't necessarily directly re relevant, but I worked a long time trying to figure out how in the world do I take the strings that I get off the request and convert to uh, the actual runtime type, because I don't have to deal with that in my application, especially if you've got some sort of a complex object, dates or whatever. Uh, JAXRS is a nice, very robust uh, provider library for a message body reader or, or these converters that they'll take that JSON and or, or text string and convert it for us. So uh, we use that. And here the, the apply method is Jersey's hook into our class. So when it's dispatching the method, it's going to, oh, it goes with this class, which has been instance of call context, and it's going to call apply and pass in that container request context. And from there, we can start uh, pulling information out and, uh, and do what we need to do. So if, there's, uh, if the resource declares a body type, then we're going to call that off the request. Uh, and since we have Jackson enabled, we can actually pass it JSON and get a real object. Um, and that handles there. Uh, there on line 31, we're going to walk through the, the parameters. I do a a little operator overloading there. I've got one list plus another list, so technically not the most efficient way to do that probably, but I can add those two lists together and get a different list, and then I can iterate through each of those. So for each, and I call it query parameter, but basically for every parameter, I want to pull the values out and, and process that. And that param, again, um, it's going to look up in the converter, can I convert this string to this type? If the converter knows about it, it'll convert it for me. Uh, if not, then I will try to convert it myself based on you know a, a very small list. And here you see a nice uh, Kotlin control object or uh, control structure there, the the win operator, win param param type, and we, in that lambda we have, um, or in that block, we have the a class. If param type equals class, then call params dot put name and value to int. So we kind of work there. We could do that in a, an if else, uh, but uh, this is more concise. A little, bit, a little bit like the switch statement you might see in Java, operates on any um, 
really the the left hand side of that is is very very flexible in Kotlin. Um, so that's a that's a pretty exemp simple exemple example. If we get to the bottom, we don't know what the type is. Parameter converter can't handle it. We can't handle it. Then we're going to throw an exception. And if any exception is thrown during conversion, we're going to catch that and uh, throw an exception. All right. Now we want to call our code. Or we actually want to call back into the application. So we've got resource. The resource has a handler. We want to call invoke. So we've got a, a function reference. Uh, it's an object uh, itself. We can do reflection on that, look at all sorts of weird things on there. But it has a method on there called invoke. And that will actually call the method that it's pointing to. And we want to point, we want to pass that call context to it. So we, we pass in this. We're going to pass our, ourselves in. So back in our uh, description here for the items resource, uh, if we, we want want that to be uh, to call the function list items. Let me control click on that a little bit faster. So this is the, the definition of our handler. It's a function takes one parameter of type call context and returns a response. So we're going to um, we're going to try to look up the parameter ID from the uh, context params. It might be nullable, so we have to declare um, well, what we're doing there is we're taking that value and we're casting that to an int. If it's there, it'll convert to an int, but it might not be. So we, uh, we put the, the question mark on there. Um, and now you can see here on the left-hand side, the type of ID is int question mark uh, by nature of that, uh, that as. That's, a, that's the Kotlin version of casting there. Won't ever have to cast that again. So then I'm going to create, a, create an item. I'm going to pass in the ID, and I'm going to give it a name. And here you see some string interpolation in Kotlin. I can say $ID, and it will, uh, it'll know that that's a, a variable. I'll replace that value. If it's more complex, if I wanted to call a function on it or do some math on it, I could say $curly and put largely what I want in there. Um, um, there are probably limits. You don't want a big block of code, but you can do a lot of stuff inside the string. So no string.format, no string builder, uh, unless you just really want to. You can just use string interpolation. So very nice. And then we're going to create a response of type OK. We're going to pass it to item, build the response, which is a, a, a jersey. It's a, it's a builder API they've provided. And then that will take that object and pass it back up through our code into jersey and back out on the wire. So to see that uh, end to end, we're going to run our example and hopefully I've left it in a runnable state, and I have. So we'll go to the command line here. There we go. All right. We're listening on localhost, port 9090, and we'll call items. Now, in theory, like if this were a real REST API, I would have a list of items, but uh, we get a single object. I put the V on there so you can kind of see stuff if you're really curious, but we're getting items. Um, you can see it's, it'll accept anything because we haven't specified anything. The response coming back, uh, you can see we're setting the, the content type that we specified, and uh, you know, Jersey's doing all that for us. But we do get a JSON object back. And if you notice in our code, all we, we just returned the actual object. Um, we didn't specify ID, so we get a, a null there, but it handles that neatly for us. One of our other endpoints, though, if we scroll down, we've got items slash ID. If you want to get a particular item out of that collection, we can pass that in. Uh, we, this, um, since we're using Jersey, we can use the, uh, the template there in the path. We want that to be handled by get item. Uh, the variable name is ID, and it's going to be of type int. So if we take a look at get item, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to pull it uh, from the context parameters. If, uh, if ID is a valid value, um, then uh, we're going to run this block. We're going to create, just like we did earlier, create an item, pass the ID, 
in return response. Uh, control returns there if it's non-null. If it, if it is null, then we're going to throw up a bad request exception. So here I'm going to take that V off to cut down some noise. But So we're going to pass a parameter in. And now we've we got our ID and we're building our object correctly. And, uh, and just for grins, a little more complex example, uh, server sent events, if you're familiar with, anyone familiar with that concept, um, it's good for logging or whatever, you can connect to a, an endpoint and the client stays connected and the server just starts pushing data to it as it's available. It's a little bit like WebSockets, uh, but I think WebSockets are bi-directional where this is uh, unidirectional, just for pushing data. So it's real great if you want to watch a log or, you know, stop quotes or whatever. Um, so we're going to uh, hear from our Kotlin code. Uh, event output is a Jersey Java class. Uh, the compiler doesn't care. Um, most of the stuff is, uh, is in uh, is Java code. We're going to declare a thread. Um, that's how you, you can declare a thread in, in Kotlin by calling the, the thread method, passing it the, the object. It'll create the thread, it'll create the runnable stuff for you behind the scenes. All you've got to do is, is call that one function. Then we're going to loop. We're going to create 10 items and write that to the uh, event output object. So when, um, when the client calls this, what it's going to do is uh, it's going to get a response of type OK. The entity is the event output object, which is what we'll use to write stuff to. And we're going to set the, the, the type to server sent events. So if we put the dash V back on there, so you can kind of see what's going on. And it dies. That is the best part about demoing. Oh, there we go. I'm not sure why that uh, one worked and the other one didn't. But you can see we're, we changed the content type there in the method and we're pushing data back and then the client would then take those data messages, pull the JSON out and, uh, and do whatever, whatever you want to with it. And that, that's, that's really it. Um, you know, the, the real value that Kotlin brings to it is, is being able to build that type safe uh, builder to build your data model and then of course you've got to do something with it. So what we've seen here is that type safe builder in use and some of the language features that go into that and uh, a, a moderately complex example of the interop between Java and Kotlin. Um, the JetBrains developer advocate uh, Hadi Hariri, I hope I pronounced his name right because he made someone made fun of someone on Twitter for getting it wrong but uh, he said at a conference a couple years ago, anytime he's asked, what library should I use in Kotlin to do whatever? His re response is, well, what Java library would you use to do that? And he said, just use that. It's the, the interop is that good. Um, there are some, some weird things. You get JPA and Hibernate, uh, EJB. When you start talking about um, proxied classes and things, they're a little weird. But generally speaking, if there's a library in Java you want to use, just use it. So this is a, this is a really good example of that. Um, it might be that you want a Kotlin specific library to do some more uh, idiomatic type things, be able to, to work in a more Kotlin type uh, manner. Uh, but there's no need to. So um, you can just take your your Java library, wrap that up as you see fit, and uh, and run with it. So uh, any any questions about that? Anything I can go back over and and uh, hopefully answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, say that again. I'm not sure that the SSE support in Jersey would, would let you do that. Um, 
since it's it's streaming, it's kind of an open-ended thing. So the client has to be prepared to to handle that. And of course, it can at, after it gets X number of responses, it can then quit. You know, just kind of close the connection and move on. Um, but in terms of you know, hey, I'm streaming images to you, and all of a sudden you send it a you know a 50 meg JPEG or something, and it can't handle that. Um, there's no no real nice way to uh, to do that, as far as I'm aware of, through through SSE. All right. Well, uh, Q and A. Uh, some resources uh, if you want to to look over the official documentation. That first link is going to be your best bet. TypeSafe Builders. Uh, that's the official Kotlin documentation on that. A lot of good stuff on there. Uh, if, if you haven't used Kotlin before, uh, of course, kotlin.org, you see that second link. That's the, the, the official site for the language. Really, really good documentation. Um, the, uh, the JetBrains people are really good about answering questions uh, in the forums and on Twitter. Um, but the docs are really great. They've actually, uh, kotlin also targets the job, JavaScript, so you can write JavaScript in Kotlin. And they've got an online um, tool, you can go and uh, type in some Kotlin code, tell it whether you want to target JVM or JavaScript, and click the run button, and it'll actually run it, and you can see things running live. So it's kind of like a, a web-based REPL. Um, it's a great way to, to play with it and, and see what you can break with that and install things and, and that sort of thing. So um, highly recommend uh, both of those, and of course, if you really want to look at the actual source code, you know, it's, it's open source, you can download and compile. Uh, it's there on, on GitHub. Uh, my info, in case you care about any of that, uh, jasondl.ee is, the, is, the, is my blog. Uh, you can find everything. Uh, all these are the links there, and that's the link to the Bitbucket. Uh, this project is on Bitbucket, so if you want to check it out and play with it, make it production ready, that'd be awesome. Um, it's something I'll probably play with as time goes on, because I just want to see how far can I push this. Uh, but I don't know if it'll ever be... Uh, like a real project. There are lots of things kind of like that that are um, you know, based on Netty that are more uh, Kotlin native, I guess, but um, it's, a fun, uh, it's a fun scratch to itch. Itch to scratch, there we go. All right, uh, well, if it, no more questions, that's all I've got. I uh, hope that was helpful for you, and uh, we'll see you guys hopefully uh, next month.